Shared parenting time and that the child and spousal support doesn't, you know, have them sleeping on friends, you know, have them sleeping on friends' couches and unable to work. Uh, my role there, I'm the liaison with the maintenance enforcement program, so I have access right to the executive director level of maintenance enforcement to help people deal with some of the draconian enforcements of our government. And then I'm kind of the legal guru, so if you have questions about family law and stuff, I can help, help with those. Hi hey everybody, I'm going to use Matias Batao, I go a math, to make it to everybody. Uh, I'm a member of the Father's Rights uh, Movement in Alberta. Um, I'm just kind of doing the same thing that uh, they do, uh, just trying to raise uh, awareness of all these big, big issues and uh, trying to fight uh, for our kids, like our quality and, and the future of our kids, right? Um, I don't know, some of you might see me uh, driving around with my trucks or holding signs on the courthouse. I've been doing that for uh, quite some time already. Um, well, just trying to make sure that people understand that this is a real issue and uh, it's definitely going to affect uh, our future generation. We actually don't act and do something about it. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine. Um, I am a Father's Rights activist for Father's Rights Canada on our Facebook page. I'm also an executive for CAFE. Um, I, uh, in the last couple of years, I found uh, a purpose to this cause. I'm 13 years of alienation with two men in my family. My husband went through nine years with now an adult son. So we have a good relationship now. And then my brother uh, is going through six years through parent alienation and no movement or no finalizes in his divorce. Any discussion on uh, division on property. And I also took care of him sleeping on my couch for six months this year. So uh, I'm here to bring awareness like everyone else up here and uh, help with anybody with any questions. Thank you. Okay, I'm Karen. I do the YouTubes and uh, I tend to talk a lot. I'm going to try not to monopolize the conversation. Um, you all saw me up there. Uh, I was uh, just going to say, in my own defense, I had heat stroke and it was about 3 o'clock in the morning So uh, when that was filmed. So, um, But uh, I guess the first question? Yeah, do we have any questions? We want to have an interactive dialogue. So is, there any, sorry, is there anybody here that has a question that for our panel to get things going? Okay, let's hear it. What is the current success uh, What is the current success rate for fathers trying to get 50-50 custody? Children, do you have like any kind of numbers where you know, fathers are very active and want to continue to be active? Alberta? Yeah. So the question was what is the success rate for men that try to get 50-50 custody of their parenting? I think, I, can everybody hear me if I just talk? I, I, but we're the, the, the stream probably won't hear you. Oh, sorry, that's... I, I, no, sorry, that's, she, she repeated the question. So, yeah, okay. so, so the published number says that uh, shared parenting is about 70-some percent. But you have to understand how the court defines shared parenting. So a father who gets only four days a month that's considered shared parenting, you know, by the definition of the courts. So that's a big part of the problem is, you know, in actuality, if you think of shared parenting as 50-50 time, it's well under uh, probably, you know, uh, women probably get the, what I would call sole custody, how dads have less than 50% of the time. 
uh, well over 85%. Um, you also have to consider too that um, it's really gonna, it's all going to depend on how cooperative your spouse is. I mean, I, I know somebody who went through all the things that your brother is going through in terms of division of property and uh, and money and all of those things. I think he's nine years separated and still not divorced um, because of she's and she's gone through three lawyers and they all quit. She didn't fire them. So, um, but. He has 50-50 custody, which is kind of a miracle, and he hasn't really wanted to make waves with the money thing too much because he doesn't want her to change her mind about that. So, but it really does depend on the situation and how willing a, the the female spouse is. Really, I mean that's that's really what it boils down to: how willing she is to uh, to share custody, um, given that. When things go to court, um, and most of most of these decisions are made out of court, they're made through mediation or they're settled between the parties without going to court. But when when things do go to court, uh, those decisions trickle down into case conferences and the recommendations of lawyers and the recommendations of the judges in the case conferences. Uh, when you sit down with them and they tell you, well, here if it goes to court, here's how things are going to fall out. Um, that's usually, uh, you, t you do that and then the next step up is actually going to court. So if you actually go to a case conference, uh, you, your judge sitting down with you informally, no prejudice, in a no prejudice conference, is probably going to tell you uh, as a man, you know, don't push it. You know, unless, unless you really think that you can, you can prove that she's unfit, it's, it's just going to waste a ton of your time and a ton of your money and you're not going to get what you want anyway. So. 50-50 is pushing it in this, in this legal climate, absolutely. Um, if she doesn't want to share, then, then it's, indeed it's pushing it. And, you know, like most lawyers and most, uh, most legal advocates will say, if she's absolutely adamant about not sharing custody, unless she's unfit, unless you're worried about your children's safety, you might as well just give her what she wants. Um, and, and, and reflection on what Karen was talking about, okay, um, from my experience, uh, my brother is uh, suffering from a loss of lots of money due to this process because she's locking in a 70% amount of time with her children to, in order to pay lieu of her, ch of her mortgage with child support. So she's fighting full child support so she can live in his house, okay, and have them all the time. He gets them to see them four days a month. So where's the where, where's the the exact equality behind that, right? The children are suffering in the end, right? Lack of having a father in their life, just so she's secure, paying her child support with her mortgage. How is that fair? Shouldn't the money be contributed to the children's welfare? Okay, a house is one thing, and yes, you need to have a home for your children. But if it was Split down the middle, right off the hop, okay? Equity and child. Generally, there should be no reason for child support. Unless the man makes incredibly more, okay? Then the percentage of what he makes more should be split 50-50. Not 50-50 right from the, right, the get-go when she's sitting at home doing nothing and him paying the
in the best interest of the child. Now, attached to that law, that legislation, is a set of policies that describe the best interest of the child in the view of experts to be um, a model wherein they have one primary custodial parent with whom they spend most of their time living in that home and a visiting parent or a parent with generous access, so every other weekend and maybe Wednesday evenings. Right. And that would be the, what the policy describes as the ideal model that is in the best interest of the children. Now, there's been a whole ton of research done since that model was employed um, that shows that shared custody is actually in the best interest of the children, and in many cases it's also in the best interest of the parents, because um, when you have combative parents, uh, when they're forced to make themselves get along when they're forced to have to see each other to hand off the children on a regular basis and they don't have that um, the, the kind of leverage uh, that sole custodial or primary custodial parents have to hold the children over the other parent uh, they tend to, things tend to really calm down and they start getting along a little bit better um, so what but the problem with policy is policy is um, it's, it doesn't go um, it's, it doesn't go through public debate. It's not voted on in, in Parliament or in the legislatures uh, of the provinces. It is uh, constructed by ad hoc committees of hand-picked and hand-appointed individuals who and hand-appointed individuals who are self-declared experts in, in the thing. And once the policies are implemented, they're in there like, like, uh, like a tick. And, uh, and you oftentimes need legislation to actually extract that and shift the direction of things. So what we've been trying to do and what a number of states down in the U.S. have done is introduce legislation that actually changes the policy, the general policy, to a rebuttable presumption of shared parenting. So if there's no abuse, uh, if there's no logistical reason, like he works three weeks a month up in Fort McMurray or something like that, to not have shared parenting, then shared parenting is the starting point. That is to be considered the best interest of the child. You start from that point and you go from there. So that's what we're hoping to do. Do you want to add anything? Well, yeah, I think Karen's absolutely right. So the issue is that often when guys go into court, if you go in with a lawyer, your lawyer will right away, and this was my experience and the experience of many men, is the lawyers immediately start talking to you about money, how much income and stuff. And they, they don't talk to you about your kids, which is shocking because most guys are very concerned about having time with their children. And that's because the lawyers sort of know that when they walk into court, when it comes to the parenting elements, the woman's almost guaranteed the custody. And as, as Karen sort of mentioned earlier, she said, it's all up to the woman. Like if she wants to play nice and share the kids with you, you'll get 50-50 parenting, but it's up to her. Now, the default in, in thing in, in the courts, if you get 60% of the time with the children, and it's 60-40, not 70-30. Yeah. If you get 60% of the time with your kids, you get full child support. So I've literally met guys who are having you know, a basic, very basic income job. They're struggling a great deal, and uh, their ex is married to some guy from Fort McMurray who makes a quarter million and uh, she's doing very, very well. She's got a job at the U of A as an administrator making 90K and she has full parenting with the kids. He is paying her full child support despite the fact that she has enormous more income. And it's, so women often fight for that 60% because of the income that it gets them. And I've, seen, I've stood in court while the lawyers, the judges pronouncing a judgment, the lawyers literally tapping on a calculator, not paying attention to the judgment to make sure she's got that 60%. And that's often what judges do. They don't want the conflict to go on. So they will make an order guaranteeing her 70% or so. So that there's no argument. Because that line of 60-40, you know, if it's a couple days here or there, a couple hours here, you know, some fathers, the, the mom's like, well, if I give him a couple extra days here, that might toss him over the 40%. And I don't want to be in court to fight about that. So, you know, for the money thing, it's easy. If you have 20% time with your kid, child support should be adjusted by 20%. So you have a little more money to enjoy the time with your child. But right now, once you cross that 60-40 threshold, that parent who has 60% gets 100% child support, 100% child tax credit, and that's a lot of money per month. And that's, that's a big reason for the conflicts in court. So as Karen said, you know, a couple of solutions if we could mandate that the 
child support is split by time in some reasonable way and a presumption of 50 50 share of parenting so that you know everybody goes in the court to fight about the money because the presumption is mom's going to determine the, the time with the child and she pretty much gets to say what she wants and she's going to get it what i want to add to that is that i guess that we we all are guilty of what's going on right here because i mean as you say the lawyer to the calculator and yeah you take the easy way out so what i think that we should all do we shouldn't go into the courthouse and beg in the court or the judge to give us a little bit more time this is our right this is our kids it's we have the rights just as much as the mother i don't care you know how much money i make how much money i didn't make i pay full child support since i separated from my ex uh, it took me four and a half years to accomplish uh, shared custody even though i had shared custody and some of the times I actually i had more time uh, with the kids than the mother did i still paying full child support because my mother is the kids man i really don't care about the money money comes and goes um, but we should change that mentality that uh, we are going in there uh, where we are ready to lose you know we can't we can't walk in in there ready to lose we have to walk in there thinking hey we have the same rights and fight for that we just can't let that that, that, that go that needs to change at some point can you guys define parental alienation too like and what that the impact on the children because i think that's sometimes like kind of a big well it's not a big concept it's a, it's mis miscommunicated sometimes i think by our social services so i i want everyone to understand the impact on the children as well just want to make a comment i've, I've gone to the courts a lot I've spent a lot of time in the courts and from what i've seen and other people going through it uh, the issue isn't so much the law the laws what new laws are we going to to draft a law and, and reading through it a lot and sitting in court and listening and seeing other things the law is not too bad it's the judgments that come out of the law it's the it's the law right from the lawyers of immediately knowing statistically they're just running the stats they just got a job and they're running stats statistically the male is going to lose so let's just run with that that's an easier way out the laws already say basically you can it's 50 50. the laws don't distinguish that the woman should and the man has to prove but from my experience it, it's the courts and the judgments and, and the lawyers that are the problem statistically the, the woman ends up getting the better end of the deal and i think that's why i don't think drafting new laws is is going to be the answer i think the law is actually not too bad already we have to change the wording of it or reform the court system so that the lawyers and the judges are actually going to apply the law better this is my i'll say that cafe has tried many times to pass um like 50 50 resolutions and the usual suspects have shut us down basically so if there's this this fellow over here all right i got a question why is it that women are allowed to use their child as um how do you put it they use them for the game to get money from the guys instead of actually look at the real caring for their children i've gone to a couple courts and seen that the women twist words against the man to get what they want instead of oh i can get more money out of them if i twist their words against them to get more money but really they're not looking at what the kid really truly needs we have one question from the live stream, so Matt's going to ask it for a live stream person. Someone on YouTube. Okay. The Great Indoors asked, how is the 60-40 being justified in court, especially when the income for the woman is higher? And any possible response from the panel? We will turn the mic back to the panel now. There's a few different questions. Well, it all goes to what Karen mentioned earlier, that the courts define everything in family law by what they call the best interests of the children. I have a math and physics background, and you know, whenever you write an equation, some of those variables will have different weights. And the, the, by defining all the weight, 100% of the weight on the best interests of the children, combined with the fact that in family law you have you know, enormous judicial discretion in decision making, what it typically allows a judge to do is by assigning sole custody to one parent the parent who doesn't have custody now it doesn't matter at all 
because it is 100% best interest of the children. Let's say we have three variables, x, y, z in an equation. And typically, you know, they're all equal. x plus y plus z, they're equal. Now you have an equation where the outcome is 1,000 times x, you know, one, five times y, and one times z. Z doesn't matter anymore for the outcome. And so once you, you know, this best interest definition allows you to give the kids to one parent, and now only that parent is important. Only the parent who has custody is important. The other parent doesn't matter. You can take his house, you can take his car, you can, you know, take 80% of his net income. It doesn't matter. If they think it's in the best interest of the kids, and the person who has the kids is now attached to them, that's how they justify that. So it all goes to that best interest definition. And I think that's one of the things we need to throw out. Yes, the kids are very important and their interests are very important, but their interests are attached to both parents. If you destroy one parent, that's not in their best interest, and the courts don't see it like that. And, oh, the alienation element. The alienation is a, is a really terrible and tragic thing, and it's, it's part of the way, you know, it's often women, but also some men too. You know, once they have those kids, particularly the majority of the time, in the bitterness and in the importance of maintaining that 60% time, they will alienate the children against the other parents. So they'll tell the kids that the other parent is bad, the other parent doesn't want to see them. Okay. And I, I, I help guys in court quite a bit, and one of the big things I see is mom saying, oh, the kids don't want to see you. Right. And that's the excuse. She goes into court and she says, well, your kids don't want to see you. And then I help the father write a proper parenting application and parenting contact order. And we get that contact. And the day the dad talks to his kids, it's like, Dad, it's so nice to talk to you. I've missed you so much. Or Mom, I haven't talked to you in so long. And they're so happy. Right? It's this nefarious alienation. Sometimes, after a long time, those kids do say they don't want to see that parent. It's, it's Stockholm Syndrome. You know what Stockholm syndrome is, right? It's it's this alienation where you're you're literally turned again. You're you're attached to your kidnapper because now you know if something happens to the kidnapper, it's going to happen to you. We have some really crazy cases. Some some girls abducted at young ages and kept for many years by some you know really sadistic person, and they have child you know child with that person. They're locked in a basement and they actually start to like that's the father of my my kids. <laughs> um, so that's alienations like that. A good person you can talk to, Monique, is my son. He went through it. He could certainly tell you about it. He's here today, in fact. Well, it's it's using the children as a as a weapon against the other parent, but it's also um, it really is a way to sever uh, any relationship or any any need to. Uh, have that awkward conversation on Saturday afternoons when the other parent wants to come pick up the kid. Um, and, and it is a way of getting back at them. Uh, even if they never really know what you're telling their kids, even if the other parent never really knows that you're telling their kids, well, you're telling him in court that the kids don't want to see you. You're telling your kids at home that daddy doesn't want to see you. He just doesn't care. Right? He just doesn't care about you. He's, he's off you know, doing, having fun without you. And uh, so, of course, the kids, after enough time of getting a steady diet of that, are going to eventually decide that they really don't want to see their dad. And it's, it, it is, I think, um, I don't think it's normal parents. I think most parents who do this have to have something a little bit wrong with them, um, whether it's narcissism or histrionic or borderline personality disorder or something similar to that. It is. It's an extremely controlling, abusive thing, and it's not just, it's using the children as, it's like picking up your kid and beating your ex-spouse with your, with your child, right? That's, that's really all it is, so, yeah. Anybody else want to comment or question? Pete, let's go first. Well, the... The concern I have is that the courts make no effort whatsoever to look at the responsibility of both sides, and most particularly the mothers. Uh, is there any movement in, in that? Are you, are you talking responsibility for the breakdown of the yes. marriage? Yes. Yeah. And, and, well, for the breakdown of the marriage and the, well, and, 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 and the, and the, and the uh, uh, parenting of the children. Speak to that, anybody? 
Okay, okay. Karen. I guess if nobody's being around you. The microphone. <laughs> um, you know, one of the biggest things about, um, you know, I, I don't know if you saw it, there was a, a banner uh, for the Honey Badgers uh, there on the, on the screen, uh, but it was, just, it was just a brief flash and you might not have actually seen the caption next to my face which was anti-feminism is the radical notion that women are adults and uh, so yes there is a big push within the men's rights the broader men's rights movement to hold women accountable as adults particularly when they're bad actors because that's really where we you know, we want to talk about strong, empowered women all the time, but then the moment they do something really egregious, um, that, then we want to make excuses for them. Oh, she slipped through the cracks, maybe she was a victim of abuse, or she has mental issues, or she's like, this, nothing's ever her fault. Um, and uh, so that's a big, big, big thing, but that's more of a cultural, social change that needs to happen. Um, politics and the law tend to be downstream from that. So you're not going to get judges making decisions that are super, super unpopular that are, seem to be abusive of women as a class when most of the culture would see them that way. So yeah, it's, it's going to be slow. And David Shackleton, he is the um, director of the Ottawa Branch of Cafe, and he said a few times that um, we need to have more compassion for men and more and you be a little more accountable with women, that would fix a lot of our problems. And, and Tim Goldich, I think, he wrote a book about uh, the future of gender equalities. That would be loving men and respecting women. And a lot of times we think about women, how they may have some tendencies to demand love, and, and men have some tendencies to demand respect. But we, if we flip that, maybe that would be a, a method to equality. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, on the topic of parental alienation, uh, I have 14 years now since I've seen my daughter. Um, she's in here today. She's a, she's a school teacher in Edmonton. I kind of followed her at a distance. Um, do you see any? I guess my question is: Do you see any? Do you see any cases of? of, of resolution or, or is there something that can be done about the damage of that parental alienation? Yeah. Alice is actually a, a local to Sullivan and she's helping us today but she's actually um, an ECMAS participant as well so she... And I'm a non-custodial mom. And a child support came. And a child and they're in the working by the way. She's very hard working. So um, there's a documentary coming out, it's called Erasing Family. So hashtag Erasing Family, are you guys all aware of it? So it's going to speak a lot to parental alienation. And if you can put in a $50 donation to this film, you can put a dedication in the film to your child. But um, if you can get on their Facebook page, there's lots of information about reconnecting with your kids. Yeah. There, there, there's lots of conversation and it's coming. And I was just saying, like, this, this last generation, 10, 15 years of kids, there's been a lot of alienated kids. And those kids are talking. And they're hearing the outcomes, and they're hearing what's happened with their peers. And I think the reckoning is coming now. It's coming. Cafe also has several service centers across this country, and um, they're called the Canadian Center for Men and Families, or the CCMF, and we're opening one full-time in Calgary. So your donations, if you can help, um, and also volunteer hours we're looking for. Like we need support, obviously, and resources from the community to facilitate services to, you know, bring this resolution. Okay, let's see what Matt has to say here. Oh, sorry, I got backwards. Okay, anything? Responses from any of that? Um, yeah, I think I just want to read what Alice said, is that now the kids are growing up and they're talking about the effects of alienation. Uh, Dr. Edward Kruk from the University of Victoria has been talking a lot about tearing down some of this old research and demonstrating that the modern research is showing a lot of this stuff to be very false. Unfortunately, our government and judicial systems are not up on the latest research. You know, so as Matthew has said, I mean, go in and fight and present that research to the judicial systems and stuff. Um, in my work as a McKenzie friend in law with a lot of people, I am seeing parental contact orders and parenting orders getting a lot more attention from the judges. Um, I put in a 
I helped a fellow from the UK get a proper parenting order in, and he finally got contact with his daughter after a very long time. And the judge, you know, the mom was saying, well, she doesn't want to talk to him and stuff. And the judge just said, look, you now have an obligation two times a week, you know, face, FaceTime, Skype. He's going to talk to his daughter or you'll be back in court. So, you know, the, the justice system is getting better. It's very slow. Um, there are a lot of narratives and social things. As Karen said, there's still a narrative out there that just being fair to women is abusing them, you know, which is kind of I think what Karen was saying. Um, and that's slowly being eroded, but it's taking a long time. Uh, somebody brought up are some nations passing these sort of no child support laws. Italy just is trying to pass a law right now saying no child support and 50-50 shared parenting. And the outrage, if you look online, is they're saying this is taking them back 50 years, you know, to men abusing women and stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> a lot's actually changed in 50 years. A lot of women have jobs now and very well paying jobs woman on the screen yelling that, you know, the assumption that women should get custody is part of patriarchy! Patriarchy! Right? So what? What, like... I, I always wonder when people say, you know, oh, human rights activists, you want to roll back the clock to the 1950s when it was nothing but wall-to-wall -wall domestic violence shelters for men only and a dirty dog blanket for battered women. Like, what? What? Really? This is where we're going? Like, no... You got, like, there's always been an acceptance out there. There's always been an acknowledgement publicly that men sometimes beat their wives and abuse their wives, and that when it happens, <coughs> you might not want to talk about it publicly. It might not be something that anybody wants to involve themselves in, but it, it was generally seen as something that was just not, it was just not, it's like, you, you just didn't even want, you don't even want to talk to those neighbors, because, because, and this goes all the way back, all the way back to the 1600s, 1700s in Britain with Blackstone's commentaries uh, where he guaranteed uh, wives the security of the peace against their husbands and it was de determined, it was written down finally that the common law of England said it was not okay to um, be physically violent or restrain your wife. Um, so essentially we've had these attitudes where we've acknowledged all of this right from the get-go all of these things that happened to it and then and then in the 1960s feminists came along and told us this really novel idea it was a really strange concept that no one had ever heard before that it's wrong to beat your wife and uh, and managed to convince us all that that up until the 1960s when they came along to enlighten us we all thought that, that it was just it wasn't just okay it was great it was great it was something that men should do it was part of it was just part of what it meant to be a man was to beat your wife right so yeah i i have so much to say on this topic so i'll try to <laughs> um, just one of, one of my biggest issues with family courts is that the burden of proof always lies with the custodial parent when in fact if you're a custodial parent and you want to refuse access to the other parent the burden of proof should lie on you to prove that the other parent has issues and those issues should be proven issues such as are you so concerned that there was a child welfare report and there was evidence that there was something wrong because non-custodial parents are put to prove without funds that they are a fit parent the, the burden of proof is unfair. And then I have something else, but I'll get back to it. Okay. <laughs> this fellow with whom here has a question? Um, getting back to what you're saying about Big Red in the video, um, I found a very big difference between a person who is a feminist and a feminist political organization and their beliefs. And for a lot of, most of what the MRM says, you can get a feminist to agree with you as long as you don't tell them it's men's rights first. Um, but for a political organization that wants to keep its capital and political power and the good of its members, it's a completely different story. This lady over here has a question or a comment? Hi, I have a question about the organization, actually. Is it just dealing with custody issues? Is that your main issue? Or do you go into other things as well? Like, my concern is... Um, I have two boys, they're not married and they don't have any kids, so that's kind of not where I'm coming from. But the fact that in your universities and whatever, it's 
women, women are giving, are now turned around, so women are given actually first choice rather than that. And how can we bring that back so that it is, equal, is more equal so that these men that are coming up will have an opportunity to do whatever they want and not be forced into being second hand. And I personally, being a woman, I don't think that women have been that badly abused myself. I'll just say that Tom's from Exeter, so that's the Equitable Child Maintenance and Access Society. They focus on family law, and they're in Edmonton. Cafe, where we're from, is the Canadian Association for Equality, and they're our friends. We work with organizations that have similar values and perspectives and concerns than us. And then we have Honey Badgers, which they're just a rad YouTube channel, and uh, they're a, a force we're working with, as you can tell with Karen here. And then there's the, the social social media groups, like uh, we have at the end here with Miss Catherine. Yeah, yes. So there's a few organizations here working together. Well, the, the broader movement itself, and this is one of the most difficult things to deal with with the men's rights movement, is that most of the, most men's issues are handled by single issue groups. So equitable child maintenance and access society, or, yeah, or um, no CERC uh, and uh, and other intactivist organizations that deal specifically with circumcision and, and trying to get that banned, right? So and though that would be considered a men's rights issue for sure, um, but it's it's being that issue itself is being handled by a group that isn't necessary wouldn't necessarily call themselves a men's rights group. Right. But the broader movement, is a, it's a huge, huge number of issues. I mean, you saw a lot of them on in the movie. And there's generally an organization out there who's going to handle one or several of those um, those issues. It, the biggest problem is, is that they're, uh, they, they aren't under one big umbrella organization like the National Coalition for Men down in the States. We do have CAFE now. Um, but they, they're only just recently on the scene. Like the NCFM is 40 years old now, and, uh, and you guys are only what, maybe? 2014. Yeah. Yeah, but we're making headway. Yeah. Yeah, so. And those were our events that you saw in the, uh, the movie. The two events that you saw protested were actually cafe events in Toronto. So that went viral, by the way. So, like, we do get, that's one way that we, that's okay. Like, if we want to protest and we get exposure, that's, that's, that'll work sometimes. Oh, oh yeah, no, it's it's uh, the exposure itself when you know the red film maybe gets banned from some venue or whatever, and and you know I think there was a petition in Australia to have Cassie J, the uh, the director, barred from entering the country. They were petitioning the government to have her barred from entering the country, and. Uh, but all of that gets us publicity. It got her movie a lot more publicity, and I mean she's won. She's won. Uh, she won the for that movie. She won the Women in Media uh, Best Film Award, and uh, she also won at the Idlewild Film Festival Best uh, Best Director and also Best in Show. Um, so Best Director of a Documentary and Best in Show of all of the films that were there. So I mean, she's doing well, and the the movie's getting some. Some traction on YouTube and, and Hulu and you know all of that stuff, but not Netflix because they're a bunch of jerks. Um, and I'm really glad that you don't feel like men, women have been uh, really, really horrifically abused in the past. I mean, this is one of those things. And to go to, to you know, it's not necessarily the law that needs changing. Um, you know, when when feminists wanted equal pay in the 1960s. Uh, they didn't do what, nobody did what Michael Mesner in the film did and said, uh, well, you know, maybe in 30 or 40 years when women have really taken on a 50% role in public life, in the workplace, right, when women are 50% of all of the people who, who are, you know, primary or sole breadwinners and all of that stuff, then pay will just even out on its own. You know, you know, like he said about parenting, well, when men, you know, step up and, you know, wash the kid's hair 50% of the time, then they'll get, you know, fair treatment in family court. No, they, they demanded legislation and they got it. And I think that's what we need to do as well. Um, there was a bill introduced in the Canadian Parliament a few years ago for shared parenting. And after talking with Ann Cools about that bill, she said that it was a bad bill in that it contained one provision that if 
there was an allegation of abuse, uh, it, it would just the allegation itself would really screw the the, the, the accused parent in terms of getting custody uh, pretty much for good. So, yeah. The bill was, uh, was a strong attempt to get the presumption of shared parenting is rebuttable. But the, uh, the concern was that now, I mean, it, it keeps coming to the money, doesn't it? Like the one fellow said, you know, these organizations that are politically active, they don't want to lose their money, you know, and it's the same in, in the legal system, lawyers. And right now, family law is the most expensive element of law in Canada. It costs more. And yet, if you go to the University of Alberta, there's not a single family law professor. Not one. Right now, the students at the University of Alberta are instructed by a family law lawyer who comes in to teach those classes. So, despite being the most expensive and costly element of our Canadian legal system, there is no actual education for the generation of lawyers coming in. So, it really comes down to the money. And the fear, I think, with part of that, that portion of the bill is that, well, now you're going to create a situation where, in order to get that 60% and get that money, we're going to make an accusation. And that's going to open up a huge conflict in the judicial system because, you know, now that comes in. And Alice, you know, what you brought up is very important. The fact that we've seen, particularly in family law, particularly in criminal law, where women make accusations against men, we have literally flipped the foundation of our legal system upside down, where now the, you know, the accused has to prove their innocence. And the burden of proof is always supposed to be on the accuser. It's a foundational element of our legal system. And myself and many fathers who've been in custody battles, you know, I was actually attacked by a, a knife wielding ex, and yet I could get no traction with that in, in the system. The presumption was, well, what did you do to her? And so you were guilty. You were somehow bad. You must have done something to deserve it. You were asking for it. Yeah, that's the assumption. That's the ridiculous stuff. And there's no, there's no burden of proof. I meet many guys who come to me for legal support and help, and so often they show me on a, you know, they're under an emergency protection order. But somebody basically went to the Justice of Peace and said, well, I'm afraid of him. And I don't, I'm not coming to the same house as him. And the JP says, well, okay, sign off on an emergency protection order. So the guy's at home. Please come knock on the door. And they say, you got 10 minutes to be out. Away from her, away from your kids. And you'll get a time in court in about three weeks to, to discuss this. So in the meantime, you're out of your house, and she's rampaging through your bank accounts and rampaging through your properties. And I, it can be flipped around sometimes, too. I, I've seen women on the receiving side, but a lot less. And there's just an assumption that if she says you're a threat to her or dangerous, she gets that emergency protection order. And now you go into family court, and it's like, well, I had an EPO. And hold on. The judge struck it throughout the EPO. Yeah, but I had an EPO on you. Yeah, but the judge, when he saw the evidence, he threw it out. Yeah, but you had an emergency protection order. There's just this assumption. Society just flies into the narrative easily. And so the problem, Karen, is that the, th the sort of the concern was that if we allow that rebuttable element to get that 60% and get that money, now you're going to open up a lot more accusations. And now the court's got to deal with this he said, she said thing. And in those battles, she said t tends to trump the lack of evidence. Well, nobody wants to make that mistake that ends up with Get hurt, right? Just says no one wants to make that mistake with a woman getting hurt. Um, so we got a, oh, sorry, we got a question um, about surnames. She, the, the person on the YouTube asked if uh, women, he knows that women are having double surnames now, they hype in their name, and is that some sort of red flag? That's what, that was his question. <laughs> Uh, you mean like a red flag in terms of uh, should you get involved with that woman? Um, I don't know. I, I know some perfectly nice, I'm actually engaged to a perfectly nice guy with a hyphenated surname. Um, yeah, but that was because his parents were hippies. And they saddled him with the most atrocious abomination of a last name, and I'm not even going to say it, but, um, but uh, yeah, no, I... As far as red flags go, I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry about that too much. I would. I would worry more about um, what kind of shows does she like to watch, and and what kind of comedian does she laugh at Amy Schumer? If she laughs at Amy Schumer unironically, then yeah, just stay away. We got a couple questions in the audience. I'm just going to ask this though um, before, and then you can get to her. If children are important, shouldn't children's statement in court cases be mandatory? or be entered into proceedings. Maybe you can answer that after Alice's question, though. 
Um, I kind, kind of don't want to get around what you just said because my question gets back to um, income redistribution. So when we were watching the Red Pill, there was a lot of conversation about the um, inequality with income. And I've personally seen or at least wit witnessed or believed to be true that there's also an inequality with applicants sometimes for jobs. And I, I bring this up because I saw in Red Deer, um, CN and CP were having this ma major shortage for staff. And I'm very curious how many of the people that applied were female. And I wonder, um, with child support and alimony being, I call it kind of an income redistribution program, is it competing with our labor shortages? Any comments for either of those? So children, should they be entered into the proceedings, their statements, and Alice's question. Yeah, uh, in regards to uh, the YouTube question, um, I believe that no, I don't think children should be influenced in court because by custodial parent, there's huge influence on how their, uh, their opinions created through a parent. So uh, just from my personal experience uh, with my stepson is a lot of his opinions growing up against me and his father were based on what his mother would tell him. She was with him pretty much the majority of the time, right? So it took a really long time for us to get him to see how we lived, how we interacted with the world, right? And she outlined this whole weird picture that we were these horrible people and that he shouldn't spend this time with us. So if the custodial parent can have a huge influence on the upbringing and attitude and the opinion of a child, then it shouldn't, it, it can't be reflected in court. It would be unfair. You know what I mean? If, if the statements coming from a child were reflected in court at, on a 50-50, both parenting having it, then maybe that could be something brought up. But I don't really feel that it's fair for the child and that kind of pressure. So. Yeah, I'd have to say that, um, you know, I think a guardian ad litem, if, it, if they're properly trained and uh, I'm non-biased, would be much better in terms of representing the interests of the child in court than having the kid come in and testify. I think maybe when we get to, you know, age 12, 14, 15, uh, there might be enough maturity there, so. Oh, this is an interesting, this is an interesting one because uh, you're partially right, but I, I have to say I, I disagree. I, I think that the voice of the children is very important. Part of our problem now is that voice of the children in the court is carried out through uh, children's lawyers, through social workers, and through a system of trained professionals who are trained and almost indoctrinated in a narrative. And so the problem is is that these professionals often bias the voice of the children. And even actually I've seen in some cases outright lied about what the children actually wanted. So I think the sooner the courts can talk to the children before they've been brainwashed and influenced by these so-called agents of support. In my opinion, the, friend, the, the people who claim they're a friend of the court are never a friend of the family, has been my experience. Uh, the sooner the courts can actually directly talk to these children, the better and more fair the outcome is likely to be. Yeah. My case was interesting because I ended up getting custody of my children in another country. And so I fought my battle in Asia, in Thailand, and the courts had my children talk to the judges several times. The, the judges there are trained to talk to the children, and in a very sort of secure environment, the judges talk to the kids about what they wanted and stuff. And I think that had a, um, a very good and positive effect in terms of the outcome. And, and uh, the children also need this voice. And that's important because the children, you know, they know their lives are changing, and a lot of things is happening to them. And this idea that children should be protected and, and in a bubble outside of is horrible on them. My kids talk all the time, and I've seen this with other children too, and of course they grew up there talking about this now, how they felt cut off from something major happening in their lives, and this caused them more stress, more concern, more sadness. So I think the children having a say, even if we don't pay a huge attention to it, just letting them talk and be a part of it, I think it's very important for their mental and emotional well-being. <coughs> So uh, I have a much more personal experience in this and an opinion as well. Um, I think it could go both ways, of course. Uh, I mean, uh, being the non-custodial parent, uh, the kids could be easily brainwashed and you know, could go bad against you. Uh, 
but I think the the way I don't know if the judge will be the the person to talk to them, to them. Definitely, we need somebody that, that is no bias. We need somebody that is professional. I have I have in my case uh, there was a actually student in law who did this uh, this case, and this is a person that probably don't have enough education experience or anything, and yeah, it didn't work out very well. Um, I think uh, one uh, big thing that I hope one day to see change in production in Canada, it will be uh, therapy. This thing is a really hard thing to go through, through everybody in the family. And uh, therapy is something that these, speci specifically the kids need, right? Uh, so they can dig all these things and figure out what's, who's saying the right thing, who's saying the, the, the wrong thing, and try to make up their minds. And this is something that right now is actually only paid for. And I know not everybody can afford this, and I know uh, as I'm, I'm not uh, from Canada, but I'm back home, this is actually paid by the state. And it's something that is very, very important for these little kids. They need the therapy, and they don't always get it. They need the help. Okay, we got a fellow over here. Actually, you know, based on what I've seen the last year and a half, um, my wife and I have been married for seven years. We have two step kids, and the stepson, we don't see him at all because he's been manipulated by his father to hate me. And it's just recently that my stepdaughter realized that, wait a minute. Why you've been saying to me all this time has been nothing but manipulating my brain so I can't think for myself. So she realized going there and experiencing it for herself, she realized, wait a minute, this is not where I want it. You guys is where I need to be because you guys are doing what every parent is supposed to do. Protect your kids at all costs. It doesn't mean manipulate that parent to get your kids away from them because what you're doing is you're mentally Destroying your kids. How are your kids going to build a future with their spouse if they did not have that mental stability to begin with? We have one live stream question. What is to stop a mother moving her children abroad after a divorce? Is there a law to prevent this based on full part custody things? I think Tom can answer this. The uh, laws, it's called, it's basically if. if there is some sort of shared parenting or some sort of acknowledgement that there is another parent and the parents are separated. The parent who's about to move the child has, should make what's called a mobility application. And the case law and the, you know, the reasons for a judge granting that mobility depends on a lot of things. It's, it's very difficult to just answer easily. Uh, the judge has to weigh you know, uh, how much time the child spends with the parent who wants to take them they have to weigh what the relationship is with the parent who's no longer going to have such a, um, a close attachment to the child. They have to weigh you know, the incomes and stuff. So there's a lot of questions that go into that. Basically, it does typically come down to a judicial, a judicial decision if the parents can't come to an agreement. Um, in general, the mobility will almost always go with the custodial parent. If that's the situation, they'll typically get it in most cases. I think uh, Gordon versus something is one of the, the primary case laws in that. But, you know, again, um, judges do have broad discretion, but case law tends to dictate what they do. As much as we say that every single, you know, uh, family law case is unique and should be sort of analyzed as unique, every judge still follows precedence, which is kind of a mixed message. Like, is it unique and you're going to deal with the merits of this case, or are you going to follow what, you know, Justice Section so did in Ontario last year? So it's a real mix. Uh, but mobility cases are often the saddest because you know, it often involves uh, a situation where one, the parents have some sort of reasonable parenting time, one parent opposes it because they really love and don't want to lose their kids, and you know, that's ultimately what's probably going to happen in the end is somebody's going to lose. Um, the actual outcome is, hey, stay out of court, try to negotiate something fair yourselves, and even if it means the kid travels back and forth a little bit, I've known kids internationally and stuff that travel back and forth, and they were great. They had a great time. So the court shouldn't be so scared of this, you know, the kids having a different life from, say, the normal other kids. It can work out really well 
you know, summers with dad or one year, one year, I think these things can work. But, you know, again, Dr. Edward Kruk and some of the modern researchers were talking about this, but the narrative in the past is no way. You know, we want to keep everything as much as same as possible, which is impossible because things aren't going to be the same in the parents. But, so it's a, it's a weird way to try and go. So what you saying, or, uh, so, so I guess to add a little bit to that question, uh, what are you saying that that parent uh, holding a passport of the children cannot just go without the other parent now, right? Generally, yes. I mean, it, it depends on the order. So, you know, the orders now that we see typically um, don't include a mobility clause saying this parent can't travel. But for example, getting a passport, it's automatic. Passport Canada wants both parent signatures. And you can't get a passport without your ex's signature unless you go to court, make an application under due process where you have to inform the other parent that you're applying to have their um, the passport signed you know, without the signature of the other parent. And uh, you know, that will open up the other parent now knows you're trying to get a passport, and that can open up a lot of discussion. So in general, though, can your ex just sort of take your kid and disappear? No, no, they can. can. If you if you brought, went to the courts and said no, you, you know I don't I'm opposed to this, it could you know open up a, uh, an appearance in front of the courts fairly fast. Now, will they pull the kids and, and the mom back? Mm, you know, it kind of depends. But there's a chance they would certainly pull them in. If you're if you think your ex is going to take your kid somewhere, um, then I would say next time you're in court, ask that part of your your parenting order include a. A clause of mobility where it says no travel without you know my consent and information. Yes, no relocation without my consent. But in general, I mean that is certainly grounds to make an application to the court if she's planning on taking the kid, or he's planning on taking the kid. We have five more minutes left, so we're going to have this fellow answer uh, ask one question, and then um, ask, yeah, I gotta cut it off. Sorry, we are, have to leave the auditorium, and it was a very valuable discussion. Thank you so much for coming out today. Can we just give our panelists? Um, thank you very much for participating in this important uh, discussion. And so we have our brochures. If you need any information about parental alienation or our agency, please uh, and stop by our donation box and help us with our services. And so we'll just ask one more question and go to our panel. So this question isn't about the courts or anything. It's more about the men's rights movement. And that's what her, her movie was about. It was about the whole men's rights movement and not just the courts part, although that's the raw, one of the raw parts. What are the comments you could give uh, the panel on um, I, I, Trump comes to mind and some of the things, the comment recently too, it's a bad time to be a, a man and, and the Me Too movement and all of these big media events about being a man or being a woman, what has that done for the men's rights movement and equality? And uh, Alice wanted uh, Matthias also to say something about the new support group that's starting in Edmonton. I mean, in Red Deer for for men that need help. Okay, so should we get a closing statement from all, all four, all four of you? For two minutes. Well, I'm just going to answer uh, as best I can. Uh, the Me Too movement has actually really made. Uh, the men's rights movement and men's issues come into the forefront when you actually have the President of the United States talking about false allegations of sexual assault or potentially false, the potential for false allegations um, and talking about the impact on young men uh, and their relationships with with potential relationships with women, how men are men are uneasy around women now. It is very, very, very easy to uh, get yourself into a world of hurt um, lose your job, lose your, it's like social death for a man to be accused of something like that in a public way. So, um, you know, I, I think it's it's shining a light on all of this stuff. And frankly, when, when feminists really kind of um, push things too far, that's when it's, we get the opportunity to come in and actually, so I mean, I've been doing nothing but uh, AM talk radio down in the States uh, for the last probably about five months now maybe uh, between three and ten uh, interviews a week. I went, went on Dr. Drew last month. So um, it's, and I'm, they introduced me as a men's rights activist. 
Uh, they don't try and sugarcoat it by, you know, uh, saying that I'm an advocate for men or anything, you know, men's rights activist, and I talk about all of these issues, and the response is very positive from talk radio show hosts on the, you know, conservative side down in the States. I, I don't get invited on those liberal shows, so. Um, but, uh, and I'm just going to let that be my last, uh, my, my closing statement here, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, okay, to follow up on your question there about uh, the public influences with the Me Too and all, all the very liberal-minded and feminist groups, I don't feel that they're uh, collaborating with anybody other than themselves. So I find it very frustrating, especially as a woman and also dealing with other women in society. Because often I'm questioned why I do it, okay? And like I noticed in the movie, why are you so angry? Well, why aren't we all not angry about inequality to moralistic values for every human life, right? So um, I, I have a really hard time with the whole false allegations, okay? That, that's something that really drives me, okay? I think we've all been put in a situation where we've been uh, violated on a human level, okay? But to say uh, that there's this huge broadcast of women who are being abused, I believe my entire life, I don't feel like I'm repressed, I don't feel like I've been disadvantaged because I'm a woman, okay? Well, how I feel disadvantaged is that there's a whole group of women that want to repress how I feel, okay? Big, big time, okay? okay. So, so I, 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 I can't, can't accept them. I can't, I can't, I can't accept it. I can accept, I can accept women's rights because, because I am a woman, but, but I cannot accept being banished because I want equal rights for everybody. Well and End of story for me. That's what they say they do. Uh, those two have really summed it up quite nicely. I don't have much more to say on that. I mean, Yes, yes it, it is harder for our young men of today. I think one lady mentioned she has two sons now, and she's concerned about them going into university. And I think there are issues now facing our young men of today that you know our age group didn't face. And whether this is fair or not is is some of the questions that were dealt with in the film. There is you know a cult of victimhood now. We're saying that certain people like to claim victimhood status, and that can come both ways. Like women are using it to their advantage. Some guys perhaps use it to their advantage too. So it might be dangerous if we're headed to that direction to say, well, men are victims now. I think the goal is is equality, equal treatment, equal responsibility, equal accountability. And I think that's going to be the challenge going into the future. And it's a shame right now that, you know, I mean, the liberal radio show should have you on. And the conservative show should have some liberals on. And, you know, this dichotomy of split, you know, men's rights and women's rights. We need to move away from that. I don't know how they'd even start it because it should just be human rights. I'm not gonna have any to do that. <laughs> I talk too much. But uh, uh, as the Alice was saying, so um, Red Deer has uh, just started a new uh, group. Uh, it's called uh, 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 Manap. So um, they're gonna be uh, meetings. I guess every two weeks. So one uh, they had a week uh, meeting uh, last Thursday at seven o'clock um, at the Fun House. Uh, I've never been there myself, uh, but I believe it's uh, right across the uh, superstore. And um, as far as I know, I've been talking to Mikey, which is the one, uh, the person starting these uh, this, uh, meetings. Uh, so there's going to be basically uh, a support group. Uh, there's going to be, uh, um, I believe it's going to be, a, they're going to be a lawyer around. There's going to be some your classes that are different days that you can attend as well. And I don't know. Anybody that might be uh, interested on it, uh, just follow up the group on Facebook, uh, message Mike, and um, hopefully it helps. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Anyone help us uh, make a tidy up here? We appreciate all the volunteers. Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's a nice Saturday, and we appreciate you coming out and supporting us. Thank you.